Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Fran Casey, Director of Community Relations here at DePaul, and I want to welcome you, first of all, to the Holt Schneider Performance Center. We wanted to have our program here tonight so we could share this beautiful new building with our friends in the community. So, welcome. Welcome also to the Lincoln Park Community Research Initiative's 39th program. And many of you have been here, I think, for all 39 programs. So we thank you so much for your continued support. We also want to thank Bridgeview Bank for uh, sponsoring and supporting our program this evening. Uh, Julia Van Bleed is wonderful in making that connection for us every year. Just for, me, for, me. for any of you who are uh, near, new rather, to our programs, just a little bit of background. The research initiative was founded during DePaul Centennial Year, and it was founded as a way for the university and the community to come together and share the history that they had had together for now 119 years. So in order to sort of highlight that history, we invite people to come together twice a year for these programs that highlight some aspect of life in Lincoln Park. The operative word here is community. It's always been community. We believe that the Lincoln Park community is a proud community with a rich history that should be preserved. People in this neighborhood have a strong sense of place, their role as community builders, innovators, and history makers. Tonight's program, From Prairie to Performance Center, will be presented by recently retired English professor, Jerry Muldrick. In order to give a proper introduction to Professor Muldrick, I have asked our current English department <coughs> professor and member of the research initiative, Miles Harvey, to make that introduction. So I turn this podium happily over to Miles Harvey. Thanks and welcome. I'm so honored to um, introduce Jerry to you tonight. Um, Jerry, is, in my time at DePaul, has been a great friend and colleague and mentor. And um, there are so many things I admire about him. I'm going to list three very quickly. One is his work as an editor uh, of these two books, Philip Sparrow Tells All and the Autobiography biography of Samuel Stewart, which is Philip Sparrow and Stewart are the exact same person. I recommend these to all of you. It's about a DePaul professor with a secret life. <laughs> or should I say secret lives? Yeah, and, and very true, all true and, and very exciting. Um, uh, unlike most of our secret lives of DePaul professors. <laughs> thing I admire Jerry about that I want to talk about today, just because I was thinking about it all day, is when Jerry retired, he gave one of the great talks I've ever gone to about what it means to be a college professor and why what we do matters. Um, I was assigning grades all day. It's the last day to assign grades. So, and whenever I'm like doubting <laughs> what I do, like I think of Jerry's talk and I say, okay, get through this day. And, um, and the third thing I just want to talk about is when uh, something that happened a few years ago when the old cheese grater building, which you'll hear about, was torn down. Jerry gave this amazing talk, which is, I think, the basis of this one. And um, for me, it was just such an amazing thing when we look out these windows here to think about the sort of many architectural ghosts that had been right here before us. Um, now, of course, the cheese crater building has joined those ghosts. And so I thought, it, I think it's just wonderful that Jerry is here for this, this new chapter in the architectural history of this area um, to, uh, to talk to us tonight. Um, so, during his 30 years at DePaul, Jeremy Mulderick was department chair, director of the first year writing program, and founding director of the graduate program in writing. For 25 of those years, he was also a volunteer docent with the Chicago Architecture Foundation, giving walking tours of historic and modern skyscrapers in the Chicago Loop, 
as well as the leading uh, bus tours to Mies van der Rohe's famous Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois. Tonight, he hopes to demonstrate that he can also talk about architecture while standing in one place. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Maldera. Well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, most of you in this room probably know that the first known structures, for permanent structures on this land that we're standing on, sitting on, uh, are only 154 years old. The first ones that we know of began 154 years ago, and they began with the uh, McCormick Theological Seminary. Um, there is a plaque, uh, or there was a plaque, uh, just over there uh, in, by the music building, uh, the stone is still there, but I've been told year after year that the plaque is being cleaned, um, and so somewhere it's getting cleaner and cleaner as we go on. <laughs> but the plaque honors uh, the, the fact that um, the, uh, the land that we're on uh, was first occupied by, uh, uh, by, uh, by um, uh, uh, non-native uh, people, uh, first occupied by the McCormick Theological, Cere uh, Theological Seminary. And the plaque says, it's kind of fuzzy in the picture, so I've uh, uh, provided a transcription. On this land stood the Lincoln Park home of the McCormick Theological Seminary of the Presbyterian Church from 1864 to 1975. Over this century plus 11 years, McCormick emerged as one of the world's major seminaries and one of the largest in the denomination. Here, with distinction, it fulfilled its mission of ministerial education. For a number of years, DePaul University enjoyed a close educational partnership with McCormick in this Lincoln Park community. DePaul remains commit to carry on a legacy of Christian commitment that belongs to all of Chicago. Uh, just a few quick facts about the McCormick Theological Seminary. Uh, it was founded in, 18, uh, in 1829 in Hanover, Indiana. It started out in a log cabin. In 1859, the seminary was offered the, uh, an endowment of $100,000 by Cyrus McCormick. McCormick, of course, had invented the McCormick Reaper and had lots of money and was very generous with it. He made a contingency that the uh, seminary would have to move to Chicago, and of course it adopted his name. Uh, $100,000 in 1860 was the equivalent of $1.5 million today. This is, a, this is given to a body who had, 30 years ago, were meeting in a log cabin. So a lot of possibilities opened up for them all of a sudden. Uh, they were provided with 25 acres of open land on the north side of Chicago by Joseph Sheffield, who apparently never actually lived in Chicago, but was an investor in Chicago and, uh, and in railroading, uh, and by William Ogden, who of course was the first mayor of Chicago. And the seminary erected its first permanent building in 1864. And this is um, the building. It's a four-story structure. It was later known as Ewing Hall. It stood completely alone on acres of pasture land. Fullerton Avenue was at that time the northern limit of the city, and so it was really on the edge of nothing. Um, there were truck farms and other small farms behind it, and behind them was the prairie. So people began to refer to it as the skyscraper of the prairies. Um, and it was a pretty amazing building uh, for the time. It was five stories high, um, and it sat exactly where the parking lot to McGaw Hall used to be. That is, uh, I, I have no idea where I'm pointing, so uh, I'm disoriented by the new building, but it's over there. Over there, thank you. I'm not going to do any more pointing. Um, <laughs> The seminary thrived and continued to develop a campus during the next 30 years. Uh, so there in the middle, uh, looking quite distinguished, uh, there is, is the original Ewing Hall. Um, the additions were um, McCormick Hall. These are very substantial buildings for the time, 1884. Fowler Hall, 1887. And Fowler Hall is on the other side. Behind it, is, uh, to the right of it, is Fullerton. And so if we take a reverse picture, those are the Fullerton townhouses. They had been built between 1884 and 1890, 1891. And so some of them were already standing. They're in the back of Fowler Hall. And the Virginia Library in 1896. Uh, now, in 1928, the, 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 the seminary decided it would come up with a new plan for uh, this land that it owned. And the land, of course, is from, uh, oops, from uh, down here, this Fullerton is, is, is uh, I'll get my buttons to work here. Uh, down here is, there it is, uh, is, of course, uh, Halstead. Uh, there is the, um, the, the L today. This is Belden, and that's Fullerton. And what they can, envisioned was a kind of miniature University of Chicago, all built in collegiate Gothic. And it's a pretty dramatic plan. Uh, you enter the, 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 uh, the property down here through these very wonderful gates. And you see you have the president's uh, and dean's apartments. They live here. You have the administration building and the missionary's apartments over here. 
the, uh, the uh, chapel is a miniature uh, uh, Rockefeller chapel. And then you have a, sort of a living learning situation where classrooms are on, over here on the left and on the right. Student dorms and faculty apartments are next to each other here. Married students are here. And then there's, of course, the gymnasium the tennis court, and the tennis courts uh, for, um, for the full development of the, of the individual. Um, one of those buildings got built uh, in 1929, the Waterman Gymnasium. Unfortunately, that building no longer exists. And then uh, the second one, on October 29th, 1929, the Commons cor cor Cornerstone was laid. Now, those of you who have a, a good memory for dates may remember that there's something else that happened on the 29th of October, <laughs> 1929. And yes, uh, it was, among other things, the end of the collegiate Gothic plan uh, for the McCormick Theological Seminary. Um, so here's a view of the campus in the late 1950s. Um, and you see all the buildings that I've talked about. Here's, here are the townhouses. Um, here's Fowler Hall, the chapel, Ewing Hall, from, still standing from 1864, McCormick Hall, and the Virginia Library. Now, I know the date of this is uh, sometime in the late 50s because if we look back at the Little DePaul campus here, there's St. Vincent's Church. And that, of course, is Alumni Hall, which in the 1950s was the uh, ugliest building probably built in Lincoln Park <laughs> or North America. Um, <laughs> and the other small buildings of, of the campus there. So you can see uh, that they, the seminary really occupied a much larger campus than, uh, than the university did. Um, by 1957, they had come up with a different plan, however. This plan was tear everything down and build brick boxes instead. And so this uh, model of the plan is much less interesting than the other one. Uh, box, 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 box. This box had already been built in the 1950s. Uh, it was a men's residence hall, and it was built in 1950, and it seemed like a swell plan for the rest of the, cam the campus, so why not? Uh, and they started then demolishing the entire uh, end of the campus that had been there since 1864. So I've put the dates on these buildings as they went down. The first one was McCormick's Hall, uh, the second one Ewing Hall, the third one uh, the chapel, uh, and then the, the Virginia Library, and then uh, finally at the end Fowler Hall. Now, the Virginia Library is the one we want to talk about because it has a relationship to us uh, in DePaul and to the land that we're talking about tonight. It was built in 1896 by Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge, a Boston firm, and they kind of knew their way around libraries. They designed the, University, the uh, City of Chicago Public Library. They were good at monumental structures. They built the Art Institute as well. And so this building had a real, linear, real uh, architectural lineage. Uh, this is the only picture I've found of the interior. It, sounds, it looks just really wonderful. Old wooden furniture, solid wooden tables, books in wooden cases, high windows, inspiring portraits. Um, who could, what could make anyone want to bulldoze such a treasure? Well, it was the 50s. Um, and we wanted to be new and modern. And above all, we wanted to be long and sleek. Uh, <laughs> That's a 58 Plymouth. It's long and sleek, I think you'll agree, because the 55 Plymouth was a box. It's amazing how cars turned to longness and sleekness almost instantly. Furniture, <laughs> long and sleek. Houses, long and sleek. Virginia Library, not long, <laughs> not sleek. Ah, but McGaugh Library, very, very long and sleek. And so, um, the question I have to ask is, did you think that the, the students of the seminary, to protect their building, uh, the, the wonderful uh, Virginia Library, named for uh, the McCormick's daughter, Virginia, did they chain themselves to the door? Did they refuse to let anyone move the books? Did they resist hour after hour, day after day? No, they helped carry the books over. They just, uh, they just carried the books straight over by themselves. Here's a picture of the building being built. It's, it has a, 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 a linear, uh, distinguished linear lineage, too. Helmut Barsch was an associate of um, Mies van der Rohe, a friend of Mies van der Rohe, and he worked for the very famous and, uh, and uh, um, prolific uh, Chicago firm of Holabard and Root. You can see the building going up. It's a reinforced for, uh, concrete frame building with only 32 piers, and we'll look at a, a, a floor plan of it in just a few minutes. So those are the questions I posed, and that's the answer. Now they made a brigade, and they carried the books over. Uh, it, sometimes they spilled the books, uh, and. Uh, celebrated the fact when they made it with an armful of books to load up the shelves. Now, there are a lot of reasons why they would not want a new library. Uh, this room, one had room for 300,000 volumes, 500 periodicals, and 1.5 million catalog cards. What are catalog cards? Uh, <laughs> um, reading space for 300 patrons, 86 carols, and 14 private research rooms. It was air conditioned, and it had flexible space because there were no interior walls. You could move things around very easily. The only, the only fixed walls 
were uh, these around the staircases. But if you wanted to take these stacks out of here and put in chairs, you could do it. There, wasn't, there were no barriers. Uh, the same thing on the second floor. You can see how it's stacks. And then all around the edges where the light is, where the windows are, uh, carols for a study. Uh, I never understood how effective the design of this building was until I saw this slide. Because when I lived in this building with the English department, it had already been cut up into um, offices with, uh, because it was easy to divide up. And so uh, we, our offices had wonderful windows, the best windows of any on campus. But I never realized that you could see from one side of the building to the other side of the building when there were no walls there. And the result of this cheese grater thing is that it filtered the light. And you had this very nice low light, very comfortable for reading. Um, and there's a very quintessential 60s picture of people reading on 60s furniture with 60s coffee tables and 60s fluorescent lighting. Um, still, despite all those advantages, uh, part of me thinks, couldn't they have found something to do with the, uh, with the Virginia Library? Because once they moved the books over in 1963, they took a wrecking ball to it and the students watched it go into the ground. Um, of course, by this time, Chicagoans had perfected the art of demolishing architectural treasures. We were very good at it. The Palmer Mansion on Lakeshore Drive, demolished in 1950, replaced by, as you know, a very large brick box. Uh, the, Palmer, the Marshall Field Wholesale Store by H.H. Uh, H. Richardson, one of his three buildings in Chicago, demolished in 1953, wantonly so. The Garrick Theater by Adler and Sullivan, demolished in 1961 to build a garage, of course. The Federal Building by Henry F. Cobb, demolished in, uh, Cobb, divide, demolished in 1965. The Tivoli Theater, and I bet everybody who has lived in Chicago for a long time has a favorite theater that you could add to this group of uh, theaters wantonly dis demolished as well. So we come up to 1977 and a new era begins. McCormick Theological Seminary moves down to the University of Chicago campus and the land sits waiting for a buyer. Um, along, for a long time, DePaul apparently didn't express interest, but finally, uh, led by the visionary uh, Father Richardson, who was president at the time, we bought that land, um, and we bought all the buildings on the land, and we more than doubled the size of DePaul's campus. It was a, a, a critical, critically important move for the, uh, for the university. Uh, when I came to DePaul in 1988, McGall Hall had the English department, the history department, the philosophy department, the modern languages department, the nursing program, the art history and studio program, the art gallery, and the bridge program. And as an indication of how fast we grew during those years from 1988 to uh, over the next 20 years, when we closed up the building and shut the door and left in 2011, only English and modern languages could fit in the building. Everybody else had been moved to other places. All the departments had grown. So many more students were at DePaul than had been here before. Now, from its early days, McGall had to cope with the derision and name calling the cheese grater, which, of course, Barsh must have, I can't believe that he didn't anticipate that it looks like a cheese grater. Um, but what would McGall Hall have said to us about itself if it could speak to us? Uh, well, it might have pointed out that its Ur ancestors were the great temples of ancient Greece, which, like Magal, were set on podiums just a few shallow steps up from the ground. Uh, all of these are similar. It was this, this part of the vocabulary of ancient temples. Its more recent ancestor is Karl Friedrich Schinkel's Altus Museum in Berlin, built in 1830, with its simplified classicism, the restrained columns, and the dramatic horizontality. And then you have Mies van der Rohe's uh, Neue, National, Neue National Gallery from 1968 in Berlin. He was strongly emphasized by Schinkel, but he took Schinkel and made it simpler and plainer. Just a, a ceiling line, a few pedestals, a, a base above the, uh, the podium, that's all. Mies continued, of course, to use the classical podium in his long symmetrical buildings. This is uh, Crown Hall, uh, the home of the architecture program at IIT. And this is the foreign tours house. You see the podium. It's a double set of stairs, uh, a podium and then another podium. Um, family resemblance. We've got Schinkel's building, Mises' building, McGaw Hall. They are related. They all have podiums. They all have this long line. McGaw was interesting because instead of the vertical line, it had a strong horizontal line. But there's actually a building in Chicago that is closer to McGaw Hall and was its real cousin the School of Social Service Administration designed by Mies van der Rohe on the University of Chicago campus. Uh, now, when you put them together, they're set on similar podiums. They're both strikingly horizontal buildings, even though McGaw wins that for with, with its three horizontal lines. And they have facades of rhythmic vertical elements as well. 
In both, the vertical elements kind of close to suggest a, a solid wall when viewed at an angle. It's like a Venetian blind almost. When you're staring straight at them, the, the uh, protruding elements are lined up next to you. But if you get to the side of the protruding elements, they seem to close and turn into a solid wall. Both of them feature the play of the rigid rectilinear elements with the fluid shape of their national, natural surroundings. They're, they're not in a desert. They're surrounded by trees. And both exemplify Mises' concept of what he called universal space. That is, the space in a building should be infinitely changeable. If you wanted to put offices in, put offices in. If you want to put, uh, take offices out and put a theater in, put a theater in. As I said before, the, oops, the, um, uh, the building is supported by only 32 piers uh, around the side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the middle. So all the space is completely open, no supporting walls. You can put them in and take them out as you need to. Uh, and the, finally, uh, th this is not a picture from the Social Sciences Building, but the same thing happens there. In the Miesian tradition, both, like, uh, uh, both the Social Sciences Building and McGill Hall did contrast the harshness of metal and glass elements with sumptuous marble. This is uh, Mises' Barcelona Pavilion in 1929. Curious story about the Barcelona Pavilion. It was made to be taken down, of course, and uh, removed after the, uh, the World's Fair. They lost it. It was never seen again. I don't know how you put it on a train and lose it, but somebody's going to find it one of these days. Uh, and I hope they can put it back together. Um, marble in Magahal was really wonderful. It, this is what we call book-matched marble. Uh, this is on the lower level. A book-matched marble is you take a sheet of marble and you cut it right down the middle and open it like a book. And so you have the reverse images on each side. Um, unfortunately, we gave Magahal's, Magahal's glorious marble very little notice or care. Um, putting up bull board, bull, bulletin boards, screwing things into the walls. Uh, it's all rather sad. Uh, sometimes, indeed, I used to think I could see ghostly forms in the marble agonizing over our disregard. And if you look carefully, you'll see there are four hooded, hooded figures on the left and four on the right, and they're both trying to pulling at the seam between them, and they're trying to get out because they just can't stand the way we're ignoring them. <laughs> it's very creepy, and once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Um, and the cheese grater itself, I learned, wailed and shrieked in the wind like a living thing. It was quite a fascinating thing to live next to it. Without that cheese grater, uh, walls, walls like the, this is the southern perspective, McGall would have been just a bland glass box, a kind of human fishbowl. And while we scorned it, McGaw's intricate metal shell was actually protecting our privacy, sheltering us from the sun, and I think trying to make us recognize its whimsy. I was looking around for an, an appropriate um, tribute to McGill Hall, and I found this one by uh, the Chicago writer and photographer John Morris. He says, it's easy to for forget the, tra the legacy of modernist architecture that Chicago forged. McGill Hall was one of the very few modernist buildings in the Lincoln Park neighborhood and was unique for DePaul and as such an important piece of the city's architectural legacy. But more important than the associated legacies and history was its visual distinction. It was a building that didn't copy and paste from earlier precedents and made passerbys ponder its design and appearance. And I think that's true. You couldn't walk by the building without, without at least saying, what is that? Uh, and if a building makes you do that, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, now, we're going to move up to talk about the Holtschneider building here. But in, before I do, I like, want to take a slight detour to another um, style of architecture that was very popular in the 1960s. Um, there are still lots of people who love modernism, of course, modernist furniture, uh, modernist buildings. Uh, but there's another style of architecture that I think nobody loves, and uh, that is what we call New Brutalism. Uh, new, this is an example of a New Brutalism at DePaul. It's the Schmidt Academic Center, built by uh, C.F. Murphy, Murphy and Associates of 1968. And if you want to know what the formula for New Brutalism is, I would say you build a building with as much concrete as possible and as little glass as possible. And this is what you get. Um, now, inside uh, Schmidt Academic Center is a plaque that hardly anybody knows is there. In fact, I had to ask someone to move aside to while I photographed it because no one is paying attention to it. The Concrete Contractors Association of Greater Chicago <laughs> presents to DePaul this Architectural and Structural Design Award for the Arthur J. Schmidt Academic Center, <laughs> which received the Superior Craftsmanship Award for Su Superior Concrete Construction, 1968. <laughs> this is the kind of award that makes you sit down and think, oh, uh, we, we may have made a mistake here. It's, it's possible. Um, actually, I like McGill, uh, the Schmidt Academic Center. I like the regularity of it, the rectilinearity of it, the, uh, the uh, angles of it. Um, of course, I never had a windowless office in it. Uh, they're not entirely windowless, 
Uh, each office had a little window about, oh, this isn't working quite right, just about 12 inches high, up by the ceiling. Uh, every week or so, you could see a bird fly by. Um, and so that was really not, uh, it, it's wonderful to look at, but it's architecture that kind of ignores the people around it and the people in it. I asked does um, the new brutalism at the University of Illinois at Chicago, designed by Walter Netsch, who won untold awards and accolades for designing this campus. Uh, it's been partially demolished in the meantime. The plan here was, it was at the beginning of the university's home uh, on uh, where, where it is now, uh, and the plan was that the university would grow dramatically, and therefore students would have a hard time getting along the, the byways to their various classrooms. So the brilliant plan here was, we'll have a two-level access. So students in the bottom level, well, now it's dark, it's a cave, will run to their classes through the bottom level, and students at the top level, well, it, it could be raining or snowing or windy or sunny or any of those things, will go to the classrooms, well, they'll get to them like this. They go down this hole of darkness uh, to their classrooms. Um, I don't know, these pictures, of course, were taken to celebrate what, how the campus was working. For me, I just can't see them as anything but portraits of uh, alienation and despair. I mean, uh, <laughs> look at those people on the right. Uh, is that what we want our students to do with our architecture? So all of this has been removed in the meantime. Uh, so that brings us to postmodernism. Uh, postmodernism, well, it's clearly what's after modernism. Um, but uh, here's what postmodern, here's a simple de definition of what postmodern architect architecture does. It recalls, it abstracts, it recombines elements from earlier buildings and eras. So it doesn't copy the architecture of an earlier period, but it takes this from this building, this from this building, and puts it together in some new way that ideally is uh, harmonious. Now, uh, the Antonovich and Associates, who have built so many of the recent buildings uh, in, on DePaul's campus, they are brilliant at doing this. They manage to do one building after another that is in the same sort of vocabulary, but isn't just a copy of one another. To, to illustrate uh, how postmodernism works here, that's, of course, the uh, Richardson Library at DePaul, but its, it's, uh, its ancestor, its model, is the Lakeside Press Building, I'm pretty sure. I mean, no one has told me that at Antonovich and Associates, but clearly uh, the Treat and Shaw Building from 1928 served as some kind of inspiration uh, for the uh, Richardson Li Library Building in 1992. And so for, for a few minutes, I'd like to talk about postmodern elements in the Holt Schneider Performance Center, also, of course, by Antonovich Associates in 2018. And there are three elements that I'd like to take a look at because apart from the, the, uh, the dimensions, there are really only three materials here that are interesting, uh, that, that are doing things. You have the brick on, whoops, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, you have the brick on the outside, these brick piers that run all around the building. They're all, they're, the entire uh, perimeter of the building is brick piers alternating with these large glass panels. Then you have um, this amazing uh, arch at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the building. Uh, there's one on each side. We'll take a look at them in a minute. And then, uh, I'm afraid this light isn't, there we go. Then there's this curious metal thing running around the top there, and you've no doubt looked at it and thought, do we need that? Uh, so I want to talk about each one of these in, in turn. Um, no matter which side of the building you're standing on, you have these enormous piers. Uh, there, this, of course, is also a reinforced concrete building, so there's a reinforced concrete be pier behind each one. And uh, just as a note, uh, notice how the, the piers are not just big blocks of brick, but they're three-dimensional. There's a, an outer uh, pier that's the smallest, and then one larger and one larger inside. Uh, and also the upper piers are, uh, the upper part of the building, uh, the, the piers are uh, added, to, added to the piers are these smaller piers in the middle. Well, um, this building is clearly a reference to the Chicago School of Architecture. And so let me just say a few words about the Chicago School of Architecture, which um, was, uh, which was the, the name given to the style of architectural uh, skyscrapers that were built in Chicago starting at the end of the 19th century. Architects in Chicago discovered how you could use steel to hold up a, big, a, a tall building. Before this, you couldn't build a building more than eight, 10 stories high. Uh, the tallest uh, masonry building that has no steel in it in Chicago is uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the Monadnock building. That's as high as you could go because as you went higher and higher, the base of the building to support the weight of that stone would have to get wider and wider. And so pretty, you, pretty soon you would reach the point where the base has used up all the sidewalk and all the interior space, and it's not practical to build a building like that. Chicago architects discovered steel, and they discovered that you could hang all of the structure of a building on, on steel. 
That meant you could put more windows in, you could go higher and higher and higher. And these buildings, like the, uh, the first one I want to show you, the, McGaw, the uh, uh, Marquette Building in Chicago by Holborn Roach in 1896, it's a classic. Of course, you've all walked or driven by it many, many times. But it's a classic of, school, of uh, Chicago, the Chicago School of Architecture. Having discovered that the steel will, be, the will form the structure of the building, the architects then decided they would cover the steel with materials that showed you where it is. And so the, the, the hallmark of a, of a uh, Chicago School of Architecture building is that you have vertical elements that tell you where each one of the steel, be steel piers is that's holding up the building. Um, let me show you another picture of the old colony building just recently cleaned, also on um, uh, South Dearborn, also by Holborn Rouge, 1895. Um, you see how dramatically here the piers are, the piers are il illustrated. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. You can see exactly how many piers there are on each side of the building. And so when you look at this building, this side of this building now, the, uh, the, the match is clear, right? Um, it's not exactly the same. Um, it's not ornamented the same, but it's awfully close. Uh, I mentioned that the top windows uh, above the, the horizontal uh, pier, uh, uh, course there are smaller than the others and, um, and separated. Go back to the Marquette Building, and you see at the very top of the Marquette Building, the same thing happens. And at the very top of the uh, old colony building, the same thing happens. So it's not a copy, it's a reference. And that's what really defines postmodernism. So this is the kind of building that actually, it wouldn't make sense anywhere else in the country. This is a building with a pure Chicago heritage. When people look at that building, they hear it saying, I was made in Chicago. And that's absolutely clear with, by the, just by the, these walls that are around us, the way these walls are shaped. Another element, what's going on with this arch and this vault? Um, well, an interesting thing, of course, is that uh, it is the most important, uh, most distinctive feature of the exterior of the building because it starts on uh, Halstead and runs all the way through to the campus. And the, vault, the arch here turns into a vault, which creates this very dramatic three-story space all the way through the building. But think about where it begins and where it ends. It opens to the city on that side, and it opens to the campus on this side. That's, that's not an accident. That can't be an accident. Uh, it's lined up so that there is an entrance to the, from the city side, and there is an entrance from the, from the campus side, suggesting that contact between the city and the campus is critical. It's what life is about. And it can occur here in a beautiful surrounding with music. Um, that's what's going on with those arches. Now, how do they relate to the houses that you live in? Well, everywhere you go in Lincoln Park, you'll find arches. Uh, if you're walking home tonight, in the first two minutes, count how many houses you find that have arches. Uh, I found, well, I, I have many more pictures, but they don't fit. Uh, you'll see them all over. And you're, you're so familiar with them that you probably don't notice them anymore. But this, these arches are so distinctive of architecture of the 1870s and 1890s in Lincoln Park, I'm sure that's why it was built into the, into the building. You could have had, it didn't have to be a, a vault. It could have been a, a, a square kind of structure. But by using arches and making, that, making them the, the dominant extra element in the, in the building, uh, Antonovich and associates are saying, this building's part of your neighborhood, and it's trying hard to be. Uh, and then finally, what is this? Um, what it is, it's an abstract cornice. Uh, we all know the cornice is there because the straight wall and the horizontal uh, roof meet. And if you didn't have anything there, it would be extremely boring. It would just be a, a right angle. And so the cornices are there partly to seal that, um, that connection, but also to be a kind of crown. Uh, they're fun. They're interesting. Um, and what they do is um, they, uh, they mark a particular period of architecture, again, in the 1870s and 1890s. That's when the, the crowns, in particular, these, these uh, cornices with the, the brackets underneath there and there. Those brackets are very typical of American architecture in the 1870s, and it lasted for another decade or so. So that's DePaul. That's DePaul's newest building. Um, and uh, I was struck, after having studied it for a long time, uh, I, I was struck by the the way in which it says something about itself and about us. Um, it's 154 years during which buildings have been built on the 2300 block of North Halstead. They've been erected with great excitement and hope, and they've been pulled down when they no longer seem to serve social needs or to feed the human spirit. 
They're a kind of microcosm of the sometimes erratic ways in which we interact with our built environment. Tonight, I suspect we are feeling some of the ex same excitement and awe in this magnificent building that the seminary students and teachers felt in 1864 when they stepped into the first building that stood precisely where we are gathered. And it's not difficult to imagine the entering, uh, that the, it's not difficult to imagine the thrill of the new and ultra-modern that was felt by the students and faculty who entered the McGaugh Library on this site for the first time in 1963. At some point in a future that most of us will not know, perhaps this building that we find so pleasing will be regarded either with amusement or disdain as, oh, just so early 21st century. <laughs> but for now, we share in the joy of those who came before us here, and we celebrate a building that claims its Chicago heritage and that truly seeks to be a part of the architectural world of Lincoln Park. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's really been my pleasure to be here. We have time for questions, but I want to, and we have a roving microphone, but I particularly would want to invite people who have lived here for a long time, who have stories to tell that I didn't include, or stories to tell about what I included, or stories to tell that are wrong, that I may got wrong, uh, to, uh, to get up and, and just say a few words. So, well, I'd be happy to take questions, but I know we'd all be like to hear from you, too. And if you just raise your hand, uh, we have someone with a microphone who can uh, bring it to you. Uh, I'm, you have to raise your hand really high because she couldn't see it. But there we go. First, yes. Um, when the uh, university purchased uh, the campus here, I noticed that they didn't, I was going to school at the time here, um, that they didn't purchase the housing along with it. Was that already sold off before that time? or how, well, The housing was originally happen? built as rental property. Uh, curiously enough. You'd think it would be very desirable for housing, but it was built to provide steady in income uh, to, the, uh, to the seminary. By the 19, now some people who live in the housing, well, I, I'm going to ask you to, to confirm this, but by the 1970s, 77, when, when, Chicago, when uh, DePaul bought the land, I think most of those buildings were already in private hands. Am I right about that? No. no. no? Would, you, would you explain some things to us? Would you help take the microphone down to this gentleman? Uh, would you raise your hand so she can find you? No, we, they were purchased in mass, 56 row houses, um, from a group who called themselves the Seminary Townhouse Association. Right. The leader was Robert Burkhoff, who was an attorney, a uh, real estate developer, and he's the one who arranged the pricing and uh, the, the deal. He put the deal together. But they were no longer rental properties. Uh, they had, yes, they were. They were. We, we lived in the rental house. And were they sold? Uh, were, were the people who were renting then yes. forced out when the, when the building was sold? It was all part of the, because McCormick owned all of it. Right. And the faculty, the faculty lived primarily in the Chalmers houses. Mm -hmm. And Belden and Fullerton uh, were rental. Although there were still some faculty people living there, too. Mm -hmm. I believe they were sold by a lottery, weren't they? Was what? The lottery. The lottery. If you wanted to buy, you had to join the lottery. families who lived here decided to stay. Seminary Townhouse Association. So we had, uh, you know, uh, what's the uh, twenty-three to sell. Wow. Started a lot of just word of mouth around the neighborhood. Who'd be interested? Did anyone apply? <laughs> <laughs> so they they, they paid fifty dollars or something like that for uh, twenty five dollars, twenty five for a uh, a chance to buy a house. Pretty good. And uh, several houses were sold. never been inside because the seminary people refused to let hmm. them in. So did DePaul uh, have a chance to buy one? What? Did DePaul have a chance to buy one? Yeah, did probably. They the but they couldn't raise the money because they were too expensive. And is the, that organization, the, the, uh, the, was that the, the colonel of the current Seminary Townhouse Association? Or 
was the organization that was uh, controlling the sale was at the beginning of the current Samaritan yeah. China Association. Yeah. I see. Yeah. And, and what year was that? 1975. So they were, they were already sold off before DePaul even so bid on the property. Yeah. That's, I had heard that, but I didn't know the, I didn't know the details and the timing. Thank you for that. Right. Would you hand would you hand, would you hand her the microphone? So. But at least they, they can't gain control of it without giving the property over to an outsider. I, that, I guess that was. Could I say, uh, Liz Ware, who was sitting here. Oh, I'm so glad you are. Wrote a master's thesis on how this all got put together, and a book, and there is an exhibit that has been put together from her book on the second floor of this building on the um, south end. Liz, would you stand up? I can't see and where you are. It gives more detail. Liz, I, I met you before this, and I didn't realize that you were Liz Ware. Um, this is, uh, the, the book is called uh, uh, Within the Wrought Iron Fence, and it's full of um, r good writing and great scholarship about uh, every detail you'd want to know about the early years of the McCormick Theological Seminary. Thank you. But I'd like to say that Jamie Nelson, who is here, and her associate, Patty, they're back there. They, uh, Use the materials that I provide and some of my words and added some of their own, and they're the ones that curated the exhibit on the second floor. Uh -huh. <laughs> This is only my second day in the building, but I'm sure it's a and great one exhibit. The thing that should get you up there is that there is a model that's about this long and this wide of the campus in 1953, maybe? Uh, it, was just, it was built by a McCormick professor. And when you see the intricacies, you can not imagine how he had time to teach classes and put that model together. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you hey, we, we, we have a microphone for you. Thank you. You uh, mentioned in your presentation about the growth of the steel because of the limitations of concrete and how wide they had to be. At the it would be stone, so, yeah. Did, did that really develop and start in a big way after the Chicago fire? Uh, no. The, 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 we didn't, the, they didn't start using steel until the 1890s, so it was significantly later. Um, Thank you. The oldest building that, that exists, the oldest building that was a steel frame building um, has been torn down. But the, the current oldest building is the Manhattan building on uh, South Dearborn at, uh, Dearborn at uh, Congress. Uh, it's kind of a sad looking building because the, the building next to it has been ripped off and it's, so the side of it looks bad. But it's by William LeBaron Jenny. He was a, a bridge engineer, a bridge developer, and he's the one who thought, well, if I can hold up bridges with steel, why can't I hold up a building with steel? And um, then uh, other Chicago architects jumped into this too. And uh, there's a flurry of buildings built between 1895 and, and 1910 that established Chicago as the home of the architect of the uh, skyscraper. Thank you. Is there a reason why the chapel was taken down and the new one built? You know, uh, the old the chapel that was. The old chapel that was there? They intended, um, nothing worked out at this end of the campus the way they expected when they tore all the buildings down. Um, they expected the new chapel to be built where the, where the, um, the uh, uh, chapel building, building, the music school building is. I don't know which way I'm painting again, pointing again, but you know the building I mean. Um, but, but somebody decided they wanted to build it in a new modern style. 
which they obviously didn't, somebody decided that we should put a nice New England chapel here in the middle of Chicago. <laughs> um, and then the uh, Stone Building, which is the other mil uh, music school building, was built in, was completed by 1968-69. Uh, it was built by Holborn Roach, um, and Hol Holborn Root. Uh, and it's kind of a, a not, it's not, it's not a modernist building, it's not a, it's really just a brick and, and stone building. So uh, the plan for uh, a, a modernist campus didn't work out, except for McGaw Hall. Yes, oh, well, I, actually, I have to let the microphone person to pick who's next. There was an allusion to the young lords takeover. Yeah. May of 69. Was that in the library building? No. No, this is, I think this is 1977, I think, actually, if we're talking about the same thing. That was when, we, when DePaul bought the campus. And um, the, the, the group uh, bought the McCormick Theo Theological Seminary campus. And the group was particularly uh, concerned about gentrification and the way gentrification would push people out. Uh, in 19, those of you who have been here for a long time, longer than I, know that uh, 19, in the 1960s, Lincoln Park was not exactly a desirable neighborhood. Um, and uh, that's reflected in the uh, Schmidt Academic Center. They didn't build a welcoming building. They built a building that says, don't come in here. Um, and so uh, th this concern about gentrification, which was uh, on a rampage, I, I've, I understand, in the 1960s and 70s, brought people in to occupy the building. Uh, and that's, I, I think we're, that's what we're talking about, right? And that was 1977, immediately after DePaul bought it. No. It was earlier than that. No. Pardon me? There's a picture upstairs, and it tells the story of it. But it's the music school building that's just to the north of here that was occupied. Oh, I'm wrong then. As, as well as McGraw. So it happened. It did happen uh, during. The, it was before 1975 before. because it was before we bought the property. I'm wrong then. Sorry. I, I wasn't here then. M Walker was. We were. He it was, was right we, next to the occupant. Right so, so, <laughs> so this is building that, yeah. that they forced the, Maga the the theological seminary people out of 1966. to take. Oh wow. Moving in Hinsdale, and uh, well, I'd been there two weeks. I knew how to run a slide projector. <laughs> so John Holliver asked me to come up and run the slides as he made the presentation for the Stone Building to W. Clement Stone. Himself. Who was the benefactor. And uh, I walked in with the slide projector, and here is W. Clement Stone with his little mustache. <laughs> I about dropped the projector. <laughs> You did, did. But, you know, that was my introduction to the seminary. So I asked Holliver, you know, can you rent one of these places? You mean one of the houses? Said, well, call them up, find out, you know. And uh, so I did, and we, we lived right across the alley from the stone building. We rented it for eight years and then bought it. But the, the, the building was designed by John Holliver Jr. And uh, in that, uh, his style, uh, it wasn't much of a style. It, <laughs> people, were, people were searching for a style. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of style, little styles going on. Uh, that's the problem with your, with the, uh, the McGaw Hall, you know, that was a spectacular international style building. Absolutely. But Edward Durrell Stone had designed the Indian Embassy in New Delhi, and that screwed everything up for <laughs> modern architects. They, they were just coming on board. The, the, the modern architects that had some history were Gropius and uh, Mies. They all were Bauhaus transplants, like Helmut Barch. Mm -hmm. Barch ended up at Holliburton Root. Right. And he, he must have been uh, uh, trying to maintain uh, or become a modernist, more modern, more contemporary. Uh, and he disguised the international style building with that sunscreen. Right. And that was very popular in the 50s because we, we didn't have glass, we didn't have mechanical systems that could overcome sunlight uh, and loads and things. And uh, it was a real 
a transition period, and it never, it never got the, the uh, attention that it really, it really deserved because it was a spectacular building by. I agree. As you know, I agree. I, I, thank you for the correction about the Young Lords. I was, I, I was mistaken. I thought that was during the early years of DePaul's ownership, but it was in the 60s. That's good to know. Thank you. Uh, way down here in the front. Going back to the, the Brundle's architecture, uh, in the 1960s, DePaul had a similar vision for an entirely new park campus called the Program for Greatness. Mm -hmm. And in that program, there were 12 buildings that were going to be built, and out of that, only three were built. The, the, the Schmidt, the Stewart Academic Center, and what's now Monroe Hall. And then McCormick came and sucked all the university's money out. And by the time the university had paid off McCormick, <coughs> the other buildings were, were you know, it was already 15 years later. And so we have the campus that we now have because of McCormick. And otherwise, we would have had the University of Illinois campus as a legacy. So thank you, Mr. McCormick, right? <laughs> That's very interesting. I didn't, I, I've never seen that plan with the 12, uh, 12 uh, uh, new brutalism buildings. I, I'm trying to imagine how you would make yourself get through the day in a campus like that. <laughs> up, up here? Yeah, I was just going to say, David. I think it's worth pointing out that both the University of Chicago and Northwestern's libraries are in the same brutalist style. They are, and they're both designed by um, Barch. Right. Yeah. So it's not just the default. No, and they're pretty um, discouraging buildings, yeah. <laughs> Yes. So did DePaul ever did DePaul ever use McGraw as a library? You know, like no. Professor. And that's did did they at the beginning? No. Uh, the, no down here from one of my colleagues. Yes, up there from one of my other colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. The librarians looked at the McGraw program and said they didn't want to build. Ah. Um, uh. So uh, they held out for Richard. Uh, say that again, please. They held out till we had a new library, a building built for a library. They stayed in the, in the two floors of SAC. I'd, I'd often wondered about that because the, the building was a, a library, and it would have been very easy to take the non library that we had, to empty the books. It was the top two floors of the Schmidt Academic Center, take the books over. And I wondered why they hadn't. And I, I didn't know whether it was because they had, the university had a long term plan to build a, a, a library, or uh, you say, you say the, the uh, librarian the simply said, We're not moving. Felt that the library should be the heart of campus. And they'd be stuck over here. They moved to the East End, they would no longer be Very interesting. Yes, I don't think you need a microphone, sir. We've, we've got, got a, you have, Oh, you do. Okay, pass it over then. Sorry. Yes. Most of these university buildings. Is that on? It's on. Yeah, you're you're coming through. Most of these university buildings are the result of a donation by someone who uh, has on has a uh, their own venue. certainly happened here. The, the chapel, uh, which was, I believe it was the McClure, the yeah. McClure Chapel, uh, I was told uh, the seminary wanted a, an auditorium that was uh, uh, maybe similar to this room, I mean a real auditorium. Uh, the McClure family said, no way, You're, you don't build a semblance of a, got a, a Georgian church uh, that you're not getting the money. So they gave him. Is that how it happened? And, uh, yeah. That, that might have happened with Schmidt. It was a C.F. Murphy uh, building. Uh, I, I believe Hans Newman was the architect. He was also the architect of the FBI building in Washington. It was a very brutal, extremely brutal uh, concrete period lasted maybe two or three years at C.F. Murphy, but they got the commissions, so they got, those buildings got built. Right. Is that, 
I, I can see how if they, they built a, a house of worship with, uh, in it, with a kind of an auditorium, how they could have made it into a modernist building. But um, once you have a building like that, you can't. And then that's, that was the beginning, I guess, of the whole plan for modernism on this part of the campus uh, coming to an end. Yes, Liz. One thing that's kind of interesting about the building, like one of them got moved. Like uh, we need the microphone here. Wait, just, just a moment. There were four professor's houses. Three of them were along Halstead, and one was on Belden. And when they went to build the Virginia Library, they wanted to put it where one of the professor's houses was. So they moved that house, and that's the one that we see right out the mm -hmm. window. Uh, I have, I'm going to go out on a limb with something else that I noticed in, in studying this building there during the last couple of weeks. Um, the, the brickwork in this building does not match the brickwork of the stone building. It could, but it doesn't. It also doesn't match the brickwork of the um, chapel, uh, and the chapel building, the, now the opera center building. And they could have done that. But you know what? It is almost, in, when the light is right, I couldn't get it to come out in a picture. It is almost exactly the same shade of orange as the two buildings, the two first buildings nearest it, uh, as if they are trying to blend into the community again, uh, not putting up a, a completely contrasting building, but uh, someday when the sun is even on those buildings, uh, take a look at them and see if you think I'm right. But I was struck by those two are very orange, and they match exactly the orange of the uh, of, the, of this of this uh, building. Maybe I think. Yeah, could you talk a little bit about it, if there is a master plan for the university and also what is the date? Uh, <laughs> for this university? Sorry, sorry, for asking. I'm retired. Yeah. <laughs> they don't tell me anything. And what was the fate of the gymnasium that got dismantled? Uh, I, I think I know the story, but if I'm wrong, someone will, I'm sure will correct me. Uh, I believe it was a land swap. Um, DePaul wanted the land for its, uh, for its uh, art museum. Uh, facing Fullerton. They didn't want it to be inside the campus. And that land that the, the, uh, the museum sits on was uh, some kind of uh, CTA storage area. Uh, C the CTA needed more land to expand the trackage when they were doing the renovation of the, uh, or planning the renovation of the, of the station. And so um, they gave us that land and we gave them that land. Am I right about that? I think, yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. So it was a land deal. The, the, the gymnasium, I was in it once. Um, you know, it wasn't really a, a functional gym, uh, gymnasium anymore. Uh, it was, um, you know, that wasn't, there weren't regulation racquetball hand courts. There was nothing really to, about it except the, the attractiveness of the, of the outer covering, the outer style. Gosh, no one contradicted me. I may have created a whole or new urban le legend there, but, but I think that's what the, that's what the issue was. One of the things that never seems to get mentioned when you have all your brutalism time, my kids grew up playing on the hills. And most yes. of people, and that, I mean, Richardson Library is very nice, but I miss the hills and the rugby games. I want to go back to, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I want to go back to, uh, did I skip by it already? Yeah. Uh, this is the building as it was originally opened. and. What it had going for it was a kind of vertical lift. You know, it looks like a table with another building underneath it. It had, it had, it had a direction. It went up. But DePaul ran out of space, uh, and so they wrapped around the first floor a whole, does it go up to the second floor too? I think it does. A donut of another building so that uh, you could walk out from that building. So, so you had another, another classroom or office all the way around the building. And as a result, now it's just a hunk of masonry. It doesn't have this anymore. But in doing that, they created this, um, this mound here. I guess the mound was already there, in fact. They borrowed some of it. Uh, they borrowed some of it to, to close this in. But this is, I think we're looking in the right direction. Yes, we are. This mound went all the way down to the street, I believe, didn't it? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. It was. Yeah, um, we lost it. But we did gain a pretty wonderful library. One more story? 
No, I guess not. Sorry. <laughs> False alarm. Um, can we thank our microphone runner for uh, all of that? Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank Jerry. That was just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. for joining us again. Um, you're the ones that make these programs worthwhile. It's, it's great to see the community come together. And I would like to just ask the research initiative members who are here tonight, don't be shy, just stand up so everybody can see you because everybody contributes to this. Can I see somebody here? program uh, in the spring. Uh, if you don't, if your name is not on our list, please leave it out at the door uh, so we can contact you. And there's some other pamphlets out there. This was just given to me uh, for any of you who are, have your own little kids or grandchildren or kids in the neighborhood. This is a program that the University and Wind Trust Arena uh, has established with some of the children in the neighborhood. So, Pick one up on your way out. And thank you, thank you for coming.